Happy Thursday, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Today we are hosting in partnership with Fredrickson and Byron. Although, hang on a second, and I got to interrupt you a second because I'm having oh, time sure. issues, I know, but I only get Thursday. <gasps> it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. You're right. You're right. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Thank you, David. If anyone has any questions, please enter them into the question box and I will forward them along to David. So we'll be sure to answer those throughout the webinar. And if we can't get to them throughout the webinar, we will have his email up. It is up on your screen currently if you do need to reach him. If you need to listen to more COVID-19 webinars, or if you'd like to register for more COVID-19 webinars from our partners like Fredrickson and Byron, you can go to hrsimple.com backslash events. Just to introduce David a little bit before we get started, David helps clinics, hospitals, and other healthcare entities negotiate the maze of healthcare regulations, providing advice about strategy, reimbursement, and compliance. David is a shareholder in Fredrickson and Byron's Health Law Group and co-founded its Healthcare Fraud and Compliance Group. He has considerable experience in healthcare regulation and litigation, including voluntary disclosures, criminal and civil fraud investigations, overpayments, and reimbursement disputes. So on that note, I'm going to hand things over to David so we can get things started. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that we started with it because I, I now have this thing I picked up from a friend, which is uh, every day I try to tell myself what is today because I do not know. Um, and, and before I get to what the agenda is, I just want to talk a little bit about the, sort of the gestalt of where we're at. You know, some people say there's a tweet for everything. I've heard that said. There's a Seinfeld for everything. I think there is a Gary Larson for everything. And uh, I'm a giant Gary Larson fan. I own all of his books. This cartoon sums up kind of the, how the, the beginning of this, right? It's sort of the, uh, uh, or how we all feel, the central Center for Viral Pathology. And this is some insight into how my brain is right now. I'm cleaning my room, which it desperately needs, even having done some. And I found this, which for those of you who are frequent Delta flyers, you will recognize. And I like teared up. I am sentimental about the idea of airplane food. Um, and so it says just how bleak things are. So what are we going to talk about today? So today's talk is primarily uh, focused on a healthcare crowd. All right, but I maybe did this out of order. At the last few slides, there are going to be some general points that almost anyone in the world would care about. Things like, uh, can you make people wear a mask and stuff like that? But for the most part, I'm going to be talking about things healthcare organizations need to know about. Um, a chunk of them will be hospital specific, some will be hospitals and clinics. So um, telehealth issues uh, or Medicare requirements, state licensure things and the like. So that's what we're covering. If you're, if you're thinking that it's, we've got other stuff, um, I apologize and uh, I'd be glad it's, uh, uh, be glad it's free. So um, how did we get here? So the government, uh, if, you, if you think back to January, and that's a long time ago, I was actually buying peanut butter in bulk in January because I was worried about what was going on in China. And my family was giving me a lot of flack about it. Uh, our son uh, ultimately said um, that he will never view peanut butter and graham crackers the same way based on that little storage and what we ate for the first few days of the pandemic. But in January, the public health emergency was declared. So on January 31st um, came the first public health emergency, which is often gonna be PHE in the slides. It actually was retroactively dated back to January 27th. Um, and then we started getting laws, really things got going in March. And so you can just sort of see the laws that are mentioned here. And I'm not gonna talk about each of them, but you know, part of why the slides are here is if you're trying to look back on stuff, you can, you can go back and we've got sort of a series of laws. Then starting in March, the government started issuing regulations to get more flexibility. And where you see the reference to IFC, that is not the independent film channel, it is an interim final rule with comment period. And if you're thinking, how does interim final rule with comment period become IFC? I cannot help you. Um, you think it would be like a, a IFC R 
uh, WC, I don't know, they call it the IFC. So on March 30th, the rule first came out in an informal fashion, which is kind of double, uh, double spaced and put out on the website. And then it appeared in the Federal Register at the beginning of April with another one on May 6th. And those started to do a bunch of dramatic changes to the way the federal government is dealing with the crisis. If you want to see basic information, these links are a really helpful um, kind of baseline of core information about CMS uh, so, uh, flexibility on the crisis. And in particular, I find the, uh, the, that first one to be the, the first place I go for everything because it's got all of the frequently asked questions, it's got links there um, and, uh, and, and links to the waivers and the like. So if you were only gonna bookmark one thing, I would, I would pull that. I am not gonna walk you through all of these, but in the slides, you will see references to most of these acronyms. And so this is just a slide you can come back to. I will try to explain them when we use them. Um, now, having done some wind up, let's get into the substance. So first off, things are really confusing uh the the way waivers work i found startling because there are really two kinds of waivers there are some what i would call a real waiver and that is a waiver that says this law is actually waived surprisingly many of the waivers aren't like this where a law is affirmatively waived instead they give you permission to ask the government to waive a rule and I, don't, I would not call that a waiver, right? To me, you can always ask someone to waive a rule. Um, so I think that the term waiver is really misleading. And so when you hear someone talk about a, a COVID waiver, it's important to, to determine whether what uh, is happening is that the rule has already been relaxed or whether you have the authority to ask permission for it to be relaxed. I'm gonna be talking primarily about federal law. I know you guys are scattered throughout the country. We've got clients throughout the country. State law matters for a bunch of things. And it's extra complicated because whatever lawyer you're talking to, first, it's hard to keep up with the changes, right? And because I've got clients all over the country. So did, you know, Florida make this change or not? I'm not always going to know. And I'm based in Minnesota. I don't even always know what Minnesota has done. And it's changing literally on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, sometimes because of court rulings. So like in Wisconsin, there were a bunch of waivers until the Supreme Court basically declared them all invalid. And so you sort of have to know what's happening on the state level. A bunch of changes have happened that will apply only during the emergency. I think CMS is starting to realize that the planning here is really tough. And so occasionally they are now giving actual dates on some of the waivers. But just remember, when the emergency ends, so does a lot of this flexibility. So one, I have an approach to a lot of this stuff. During, during the crisis, I tend to think if, if you're in a time of a surge, the number one thing is taking care of patients. And if there is a, uh, a conflict between saving some patient or helping them a great deal and a rule, my view as a lawyer and as a human being is you save the patient, right? Um, so that's kind of one principle. And I'm willing to cut corners and sort of sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. People are often really stuck on rules and hidebound. And one of the things people are stuck on is uncertainty within the rule. And I think it's good to take a step back and realize that in America, if there isn't a clear rule prohibiting something, it's okay. And CMS did a really good job during one of the office hours calls. And if you're not familiar with those, uh, now every other Tuesday, but for a while it was every Tuesday and before that every Tuesday and Thursday, CMS was having office hours where they would answer questions. And in fact, if you ever try to find them, you can, those are, are mostly available on one of the links I had up there earlier and you can get their transcripts. During one of those calls, a CMS person said, our non-specificity provides the flexibility you are looking for which sounds a little Star Wars-like, these are not the droids you're looking for, but it's a really important and helpful statement. If, so, if, a, if something is ambiguous, it's often better to not ask. And this isn't a COVID-specific principle, this just applies generally with regulations. If, if you 
can't tell whether something is allowed or prohibited, it's allowed. Um, and so you don't always need to ask someone at the government for permission on something. And I just think that's a good thing to remember because a lot of the calls during office hours were asking about things that I, as a lawyer, would totally have blessed without having asked because there was no rule that prohibits them. All right, another kind of surprising thing, at least it was surprising to me. So the way the public health emergency, the PHE works, is that it's renewed for 90 day periods. And I kind of thought that that meant once you got a renewal, you were good for three months. And I am wrong. It turns out that actually the public health emergency lasts until the earlier of the expiration of the 90 days or when the secretary declares its end. So in theory, the secretary could tomorrow say the public health emergency is over and it ends in a cliff. Um, it kind of takes you back to, uh, to Animal House. I mean, it's, was, you know, was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? No, it's not over till I say it's over. Well, that's how the PHE works. Um, and it makes planning really difficult because a lot of the flexibilities that you're counting on could end suddenly. And when the proposed fee schedule for Medicare for 2021 came out, uh, in the proposals will make some of the rules, uh, some of the flexibilities extend all the way through 2021. Now, that is not finalized yet. It usually gets finalized sometime in early November. It's pretty likely those flexibilities will be finalized. Um, but it's just important to realize we may not know with a lot of lead time how this is going to end. Now, one of the common questions we've gotten from clients is how worried should we be about audits? Now, whenever you get any question about how worried should you be about anything, it's always good to do a, a brief perspective check. So I've been working from home a lot. I'm sitting in my yard and this is the yard swing out front. I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this. So how worried should I be about this? And no, I'm not talking about the ambulance. Ambulances are a good thing. I'm talking about that creepy litty bug thing, which I did not know what it was when I first saw it. It turns out it is a cicada skin. Um, looks super scary, totally harmless. Don't be worried. Now this, it's blurry and I apologize. It turns out the iPhone camera isn't great and when you're trying to get a bird in flight, it's tough. So this was a red tail hawk coming in uh, to grab something in my backyard. Um, should I be worried? No. Should the rodents in, in the neighborhood be worried? Yes. And then while working last week, I looked outside and saw this puppy. Um, I guess not really a puppy. And I was worried about my puppies. Should I be worried? Yes. So how worried should you be about audits? It depends a little on your risk tolerance, but also I think you need to, um, to, to separate two sorts of things. There are audits that are happening right now for things you did in the past, right? So, uh, a 2018 claim getting audited today. And then there are audits that might happen next year about things that are happening right now. For those past audits, you should be worried. Um, there is currently nothing that's formally suspending past audits. Whether it's the government or private payers, they can come in and audit you today and nothing stops it. Um, and even if you are one of the places that's in the middle of a giant outbreak on the surge, you are not guaranteed a waiver. Now, CMS has told its contractors to try to be flexible, and so you can ask for extensions on deadlines, and that is something that historically CMS has not allowed, so this is, this is special. But they are not required to give you the extension, and that means if you get one, you wanna make sure you get it in writing because there's no legal right to it. Throughout this talk, there's a problem of private payers, which is I can't tell you what any of the private payers are doing. Each of them get, can set up their own spiel, um, and it's, there's no real governmental overreach on, on what private payers are doing during the pandemic. So they can be flexible if they want, they can be inflexible if they want. Um, what's the future? Well, I, am always hesitant to predict the future. So I did a nice job. I stored up on, on toilet paper and peanut butter back in January because I kind of figured out that uh, if China's locking down, this is a big deal. They don't lock down for nothing. It's going to get bad here. But, and this is a big but, I was pretty confident that by June this would be over. And it turns out it's not. Now, I don't know if I'm just a bad prognosticator, and that is possible. Um, but I think it's actually that just prognosticating is really hard. And so I don't trust people who tell me there are going to be tons of audits. I don't assume there will be none. I think we don't know. Um, 
but just know they have the ability to audit you. An important lesson, my colleague Perry, Pari Magera taught me this. Um, CMS is regularly changing their guidance. They're doing a pretty good job of updating when they have an FQ of putting the date for each answer. But whatever the old answer was disappears. And so if you find yourself in 2022 dealing with an audit from right now and you want to find out the state of the guidance, that might be hard. So the tip is save, like if you go to that Frequently Asked Questions website, save it as a PDF on your computer. Make sure you've got the date of the version you've got and try to get in the habit of doing that periodically so you have a bit of a library of the guidance. And in particular, if you wind up doing some research and you find um, an answer to a question on a website, don't just send the link to someone. Take whatever that page is and save the page and save it to who, if you're sending it to someone and say, here's the answer, send it as a PDF so that if that link changes in the future, you don't lose whatever you had. Now, I'm going to go through this next fairly complicated area pretty quickly. Um, but one of the really, really confusing areas that has, has plagued hospitals is how do we bill for outpatient hospital services that are provided in the patient's home? Um, the interim final rule set up the ability to treat someone's home as, a, uh, as basically part of the hospital, as an outpatient department, and you could bill the service as if it were provided in the patient's home. Um, and, you know, basically, that means you get a you know a higher reimbursement, you get a facility fee, um, but you know pre-pandemic you you can't do things off campus. There are there are limits on the ability to set up anything off campus, and CMS said, hey, during the public health emergency, we know that provider-based departments that's what a PBD is um, is you're going to have all kinds of problems, so we're going to let you temporarily set one up in a person's home, and that's when the confusing part of this of the process became do you have to enroll each person's home separately or um, you know how, how is that going to work so you don't need to uh, update your enrollment for things that are done in the main hospital but if you are going off campus um, you use a modifier the PO modifier on your claims uh, and you have to let the regional office or the RO know by email of what you're doing. And one of the things they want you to do this, so one of the original instructions was let us know about each person's home. And when that guidance first came out, we thought it was pretty crazy. And we got um, some of the regional offices to confirm that it was a giant pain in the butt to submit every patient's address. Uh, and we told clients, you do not need to get the address for each patient. Unfortunately, the regional offices that gave us that guidance got chastised, and so we are now in a position where you've got to gather the address for each of the homes. This was the instruction that CMS came out with. Um, you got to give them a notice that you were supposed to include your hospital CCN, um, and then the start date and all these other things, and attestation that you are uh, not doing anything that's violating your state emergency preparedness plan. Um, and then give the addresses. And so here's the, the backup on it, and you can just see here's some material uh, on a long Q&A where they want um, now to submit the address for each location. So I think this is crummy, but the current state of things, if you are treating people at home, uh, register that person's address. All right, I'm gonna talk for a few minutes now about telehealth, and we're gonna kind of talk about telehealth mostly from the COVID standpoint, um, although uh, a lot of what I'm going to say applies, you know, independent of COVID. So telehealth is confusing because you've got different layers. You've got the Medicare reimbursement rules, Medicaid reimbursement rules, you've got state licensure rules, and then you've got specific restrictions that apply to uh, controlled substances. And we have to deal with sort of all of those. So one of the most common questions we get is, can someone do a telehealth visit in a state where the professional isn't licensed? And I, as a lawyer, hate doing the measly, or the Weasley uh, it depends answer, but there is an element of it depends here. But let's, let's look a little bit at the, at the big picture. Um, 
I am pretty comfortable in a variety of circumstances in allowing a uh, an out-of-state telehealth. So let's let's go through them. So first thing you you want to know the state where the uh, the where the patient is is probably the most important state. Um, so the licensing rules, it's not so much the licensing rules where the professional is sitting, it's the licensing rules where the state is. And kind of asking yourself, is the state where the patient is going to care? Um, and the answer might depend on whether the person is a resident of the state or on vacation there. So one common situation, you know, you are a Missouri provider and your patient has gone to Florida for the for a, a, a week-long vacation, and they call for a prescription renewal. So do you need to be licensed in Florida to do that? And I would say almost everyone would say that this isn't likely to be a big deal, all right, at least if the prescription isn't a narcotic. Um, there's nothing in writing that really says this. It's just sort of how everyone practices and kind of how the world works, and it's more practical advice than legal. Um, I will just offer from, my, you know, I've got clients in almost every state in the country. I am licensed in a grand total of two states. And I don't worry about it that much for a number of reasons. Um, you know, clients know I'm here. You know, they're reaching out to me in the state where I am. Now, there are some differences between lawyers and doctors. And one of them is I'm usually dealing with you know, commercial clients, not individual patients. And I think whenever you're dealing with individual uh, individuals as opposed to corporate entities, licensing boards, um, are more worried because they're worried about protecting people. But this is primarily a protection thing. And so the question is, how much risk is the patient at, right? Um, and I think for the most part, the, the other thing is, I think that there's a constitutional issue here, which is there's a commerce clause in the constitution that a, a pro prohibits states from imposing barriers on interstate commerce. And if you had to ask me to prognosticate something I said, I'm bad at. I think that sometime in the next 10 years, the Supreme Court is going to get rid of a lot of these state licensing rules. Could be wrong, but that's my hunch. Uh, if you read, there's a, uh, a case involving teeth whitening out of North Carolina. I can't remember the name of the case, but if you Google teeth whitening North Carolina, it'll pop up. Um, and the Supreme Court said that as long as patients are protected, it's unreasonable for states to limit um, to, to try to impose barriers that might prohibit one profession from practicing something that another profession does. And the same is going to be true for preventing out-of-state people from doing it in the state. So the things I would consider, the number one thing to make sure of, make sure your insurance coverage doesn't prevent you from doing something in another state. Because the, a big problem would be if you get sued, by a person who lives in Utah and who has done telehealth with you, and you discover your malpractice insurer says, hey, your professional wasn't licensed in Utah, we're not going to cover you. So that is actually the number one thing to check, and it's not obvious. If whatever you're doing is with an established patient, I'm a heck of a lot less worried about it. If it's a person who normally would be coming to see you where you are, but they are temporarily someplace else, it's low risk. Um, if uh, you know, so a new outreach, if you're advertising out in California to do telehealth visits, you should probably be licensed in California. Uh, I'm, if you're not prescribing, that's good. Prescribing antibiotics isn't terribly worried. Prescribing a narcotic, super worrisome. Um, I would try to avoid doing narcotics via telehealth for a whole host of reasons. Um, if it's frequent, get yourself licensed, much more so than if it's, you know, you're, if you deal with 10 of these encounters in a year, I'm not very worried about it. Um, and obviously, the sicker the patient, the bigger the concern. So does COVID result in suspension of scope of practice rules? It varies state to state. CMS is definitely loosening the rules a lot. States are wildly inconsistent on this. So let's look at Medicare's evolution. So before COVID, Medicare had very limited coverage of telehealth. Basically, they would only cover you in a certain geographic areas, primarily rural areas or health professional shortage areas, and generally only if the patient was in a hospital or another similar facility. And you had to have both audio and visual. Interactive communication had to be real time. Store and forward generally wouldn't work. Um, and it was only for very limited codes. And 
they would pay the, the place that the originating site a fee that's called the, uh, the originating site fee and a, a professional fee and then also your nor, you know your normal so so there's kind of a, a, there are two payments right and you used a site of service code or place of service code two as of March CMS has gotten way more generous and so they will now pay for um, telehealth and uh, communicate technology-based services um, wherever the patient is throughout the country, even if they're at their house. And it, it's still code-based, but the number of codes that are allowed has expanded exponentially. And I am not going to read the next few slides to you. It's just a, a long list of the kinds of things that are permitted. So I'll kind of skip through them quickly. You can kind of look at the screen, but you can look at your handouts. It's a long list. So you can do a heck of a lot of things uh, via telehealth. One semantic point, um, there is a difference between uh, telehealth and telephone. Um, and telehealth, the, here's the difference, telehealth generally involves being able to see the patient. So it has an audio and visual component versus telephone, which is audio only. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. That now Met CMS is allowing telephone coverage for the first time, uh, and we'll come to that in a minute, but just understand that sort of distinction in semantics. CMS is even allowing therapy to be done via telehealth. And in particular, I think a lot of places are doing um, speech language pathology and are finding it to work really well uh, via telehealth, uh, and you can bill for it. Um, there was some controversy because statutorily, therapists aren't allowed to bill for telehealth. And so CMS's original position, and you may have heard this when it first came out, is you can't do therapy via telehealth. We came up with a legal argument that said that as long as you're doing it in a clinic, incident to a physician, it was permissible. And I think that that was clearly allowed. Uh, we wrote to CMS and said, hey, you guys should allow it in this setting. CMS chose to go a different route. They said, we're just going to ignore the law and we're going to let therapists do it, which I think is a great result. I don't understand how we got there legally, but I don't care. It's a good result. Um, and, you know, so basically what CMS is doing is expanding the, the types of people who can perform the services. And this slide is really here for those of you who are uh, really into knowing the law. I'm not going to talk about it. Now, one of the things that CMS has said is that um, treat a telehealth visit as if it were happening in person. You use the place of service, that's the POS, for wherever the encounter would have happened if the, if, but for COVID-19. If the person would have come to the outpatient hospital department, bill at outpatient hospital. If they would have come to the clinic, bill at clinic. Don't focus on where the professional is, focus on where the patient would have gone but for COVID. Now, that said, they've recently issued some guidance that complicates things a little bit. So if you've got a patient and you're not, you're, if you are a hospital, so this is, you can ignore this if you're a clinic, but if you're a hospital, um, if the patient is at his or her home, where the doctor is during the visit matters. If the doctor is somewhere in the hospital, um, uh, then you can bill it as an is an in-person hospital visit using G0463. If the doctor does the visit from his or her home, um, uh, then it's a telehealth visit and you bill it with the Q code. So it's kind of weird. I, I don't understand the logic on this, but the, where the doctor is or the professional is is going to determine what code you bill. Um, and if you're just looking for the citation on it, this is, I'm not going to read this aloud, but this is just a backup for what I said. Now I'm going to move on more to services in the clinic setting. Um, and so if you're in a clinic, this is the part to pay attention to. Um, this also applies in hospitals, but clinics will care about this. So um, if you can see the patient, um, or at least have, if, if they're using a smartphone, Basically, things with telehealth are more or less the same as they would have been for an in-person encounter. Um, but you use the site of service that you would have used if the person had come in in, per, uh, in person. The biggest change is that the instructions for coding today are different. So as you may know, 
on January 1st of 2021, the instructions for coding are going to change. Um, basically, historically, we've used history, exam, and medical decision-making to pick a code. In 2021, um, you're only going to use either, well, actually, hang on a second, history, exam, medical decision-making, or time. So right now, if counseling and coordinating care is half or more of the visit, you use time. In all other situations, you use history, exam, and medical decision-making. Come 1121, you will either use just medical decision making alone or time. And the counseling and coordinating of care is immaterial. You can use time even if there's no counseling. Well, basically what CMS has said is we're going to treat visits today as if they occurred in 2021. And right now you can use medical decision making or time. If you wanted to code the old way, you could, but there's really no situation in which you would come out better using the old way uh, well, I suppose there's one. If you had a comprehensive history and a comprehensive exam and crummy medical decision making, you could come out better. But you'd ask, that also would raise a question about whether or not those comprehensive histories and exam were medically necessary. So, um, so that's how you code uh, uh, right now. Um, and basically, the level of history and exam don't affect how much you get paid. Um, now, given the way they're handling stuff, I don't know why you need to see the patient and why they're treating telephone encounters as differently, but they're choosing to do so nonetheless. Um, when it comes to using time, you use the time out of the CPT book. Some people think you're supposed to use the typical times uh, from the public use file, but no, use the CPT times. Both, it's easier, um, and I think they're also more favorable to you. Um, the instructions that I'm giving right now only apply in the clinic and the outpatient hospital department. Inpatient hospital EM coding is unchanged, both in 2021 and today. All right, um, audio phone calls. So if you can't see a person on a smartphone, if you're using the old uh, uh, rotary phone, you, st you now, during the public health emergency, can bill those, and they set up three new codes, and those three new codes reimbursed the same way the level two, three, and four established patient visit do. There are three different codes to be used by non-physicians like therapists. Um, and you can do this back to March 1st. Um, and in theory, you shouldn't need to rebill your, uh, you, you, uh, to rebill, but you can. All right. One of the big sets of changes happening because of COVID is flexibility for supervision. Um, and so there are a bunch of situ a bunch of services that have uh, specified levels of supervision. One of them is diagnostic tests. And so they're loosening the requirement. Uh, historically, only a physician is allowed to supervise Medicare diagnostic tests. This is a rule that's crazy and has bothered me for a long time. Physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, and certified nurse midwives can do diagnostic tests, but they can't supervise them. I've always thought that was crazy. CMS is finally coming around and saying during the public health emergency, um, those professionals can now supervise diagnostic tests, and they're proposing to make that change permanent. It's not yet final, but hopefully that will happen in the fee schedule this year. Um, Medicare also says that normally only a professional who's treating a patient can order a diagnostic test. You have to be both treating the patient and likely to use the uh, information from the diagnostic test in the treatment of the patient. Well, that would mean that a medical professional couldn't order a COVID test for someone they've never treated before, right? You can't just, uh, these walk-up clinics would be a problem. Recognizing that, CMS is now saying that during the public health emergency, um, any licensed professional who's authorized by state law can order um, both COVID tests and then a, a certain other tests that they list in the Federal Register. It's a pretty small, it's a small list, or I'm sorry, on their, on their website. You can go to the CMS website for the other lists of tests that they will allow uh, non-physicians or, or physicians and non-physicians to order. A lot of services and clinics are billed incident to a physician. Um, now, that 
means that the service is done by someone other than the physician, but billed by the physician as an incidental part of their work. Um, CMS is making changes to those rules, to, a lot, uh, to, to the rules in a few different ways. So one of the biggies, um, so first we're gonna let pharmacists provide services uh, uh, incident to, that wasn't clear before, but now they can do services uh, that are billed by the physician. Um, COVID testing, if you do COVID testing for someone, you can bill a nurse visit, a 99211, and that's a mechanism to get paid for the PPE that you have to do as part of the COVID testing. And perhaps this is the biggest change, supervision can now be done via audiovisual communication. So historically, the supervising physician had to be present in the office suite when a service was done. Now that supervising professional can be available via audiovisual communication. And um, the way they get there is they made changes to the regulations. So one of the questions people have had is, does the doctor have to be on camera or is merely being available enough? And for incident two, direct supervision, availability is enough. And we know that because of the wording of the, ring, of the regulation, which says that the doctor just has to be immediately available. They don't have to be physically present. Now, um, the other area in which direct supervision pops up a fair amount um, is uh, uh, in teaching physicians. So teaching physicians can bill for services that are done by a resident. And the teaching physician has to be present for the service normally. Now they're going to allow that presence to be done via a smartphone. Well, is it enough to have the smartphone merely be available or does it have to be turned on? So for services in a clinic that were incident to by say a nurse practitioner or physician assistant, availability is enough. The opposite is true for a resident. For a resident, the doctor has to actually be on the line at the time because there the requirement is for the doctor to be present when the key por portion of the visit occurred. So the doctor can either re-perform the level of the service that the doctor wants to bill for, or they have to be present on the line when the resident does his or her spiel. Um, there are some other changes to the uh, teaching physician rules. So if you are in a program that works with residents, basically the, um, there are now more codes that can be done in a primary care clinic. Um, they're talking about permitting uh, primary care clinics to even do high level E&M visits. Right now you can only do the first three levels. That is supposed to change uh, so that they can do levels four and five. That's a proposal for the fee schedule, so that's not done yet. And um, we're gonna allow the services to be billed based on either the medical decision making or the time, just like non-resident services. Um, if you have residents in your hospital, well, this is getting pretty detailed, so I think I'm just gonna skip that one actually right now. Um, but if you have residents who do moonlighting and they are working extra hours because of the COVID crisis, um, uh, uh, they can be uh, reimbursed if they're not part of the residency program. Um, and time that the resident spends in his or her home or in a patient's home or someplace that's not the hospital can count towards the residency program even though it's outside the hospital. Normally only time in the hospital counts, but during the public health emergency, the, there's more flexibility. So EMTALA is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. It's the anti-dumping law. It's the idea that if someone shows up at the hospital, you've got to make sure they're stable before you send them someplace else. So during this emergency, does that rule get waived? And the short answer is no. Um, there is a increased flexibility if, you, if your hospital is full and you need to move the patient from your hospital to another place. There, there's flexibility. But when it comes to sending the patient home, basically nothing is changing in EMTALA. So if you're like, boy, we don't have a space for you here, go home you could still get in trouble for dumping the patient. You, you, you're supposed to find a place to, to plunk that patient. Um, when that place can either be a hallway in your facility 
or transferring them to another facility. Now, CMS historically limited where you could do a screening, and basically they wanted you to do it in the emergency room. And recognizing that when when the cases are really going, that might not be feasible, they are creating flexibilities. You can now screen people in other locations and even do it off campus. So you can say, hey, look, we want you to go to our uh, to this parking lot, you know, a few blocks away to get screened. That's permissible. Um, but the, if you're saying to someone, hey, we want you to go to this thing a few blocks away, only a clinical person should be doing that. It's not okay to have like a security guard standing at the front door and saying, we want all patients who are getting screened to go over there. And I think the reason for that is they want someone to be able to do an assessment to confirm that the person isn't in uh, immediate distress. So non-clinical staff can do um, uh, uh, and actually, to be clear, that was only at the emergency room. You can have non-clinical staff at, at your other doors, but within the emergency room, once someone shows up in the ED, that's got to be a clinical person who's interacting with them. Um, at your door, you know, far away from the ED, you can have anyone there. Um, EMTALA doesn't apply if, if a hospital partners with someone to set up a clinic at a remote site. Their EMTALA does not apply. All right, Stark. This is really getting into the weeds, and I kind of don't know how many of you guys deal with the Stark world, but Stark is a law that um, uh, uh, applies to financial relationships between doctors and hospitals. Um, or actually, just uh, anytime, it's not just doctors and hospitals, it's anytime doctors order a designated health service from an organization. Um, the law uh, has been, there are certain waivers that exist it's, this has been labeled as a blanket waiver, but this is a great example. It does not mean Stark doesn't apply. There are a bunch of situations where Stark won't apply, but Stark isn't completely suspended. Um, instead, there are 19 purposes uh, that are kind of permissible, um, and then uh, or, uh, a variety of exceptions that have been issued. You don't have to tell CMS that you're taking advantage of this, but you have to keep your documents explaining what you're doing. Um, so, in order to, uh, yeah, yeah, in order for the Stark, Stark to be waived, you have to be doing one of these sort of six things. You have to either be doing something that's gonna protect the diagnosis of, or treatment of COVID-19 patients. You've gotta be securing services, um, of professionals to kind of meet the surge of COVID patients or other patients. So that one's really broad, right? So, um, you know, if because of the COVID surge, you've got fewer oncologists and you need more oncologists, you stark, there's stark flexibility for doing that if, uh, as long as it's somehow related to COVID-19. And I think you can construe that quite broadly. Um, you can expand your capacity. Um, you can be moving patients to new facilities and things like that. So this is pretty broad. It just isn't universal. Now, CMS says there are 18 blanket waivers. If you look at the next couple of slides, you will see I've only got like eight bullets. And you say, why did I skip the other 10? And I didn't skip the other 10, but the 18 waivers are over, there's a lot of overlap. So one of them is above market uh, compensation and the other is below. And so I think that's really, can be combined into one waiver. And you can kind of see on these two slides, the sorts of things CMS is allowing. But generally, it's things like rent abatement. Um, if you need to help doctors absorb the cost of certain things related to the pandemic um, through your medical staff, you can do that. You can give loans. Um, you can, if you need to provide services outside of your normal clinic space, you can do that. Um, if you're in rural areas, that Stark very strangely limits the ability of family members to own things. And Stark is even going to kind of allow missing signatures, recognizing people may not want to sign stuff. All right. Um, this one's maybe a little too specific, but I've had a bunch of clients ask if they can do home pulmonary rehabilitation during this crisis. And the answer is it appears to be yes, and that doctors can supervise um, remotely. The doctor doesn't have to be in the patient's home. They can provide remote supervision. That's really explicit. But will private insurers allow it? And this just highlights that weird inconsistency. They, they're going to do whatever the heck they want. Um, a lot of people have asked me, should we do anything special to document the fact that uh, this visit occurred during a 
um, public health emergency? And I think the short answer is that should be pretty clear from the date of the encounter. And so I don't think you need to do anything extra special. Um, oh, uh, I do not know what happened there. Okay, um, so do you need a, so this is a total subject change. Uh, if you're a lab or you're an employer, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to do on-site testing at your place, does the lab need to get a specific CLIA? That's the uh, uh, Laboratory Improvement Act um, law. Uh, do, do they, a clinical lab, uh, do, they, do they need to get a certificate for the testing on site? And the answer is no. During the crisis, um, CMS will let labs go to an employer and do the testing without special certification. Do you need to have a positive test from the patient in order, oh, so I should back up a step. There are cost sharing limits um, on patients who come in to get certain services related to the diagnosis and treatment of COVID. Um, so do you need to have a positive test? And the short answer is no. The longer answer is that you need to have either had a test or had the test ordered. If the test is ordered but not administered, you can still, um, because if there aren't any tests, you can still act as if the, uh, uh, you can still apply this cost sharing criteria if there happens to be a testing shortage in your area. But that cost sharing limit only applies to the evaluation and management service, the doctor's work, not to any diagnostic work. So it doesn't apply to a chest x-ray or something like that. Um, now during the pandemic, you are allowed to waive beneficiaries cost sharing for Medicare and Medicaid patients. You do not have to collect a copay from a patient. This is permissive, but not required. You can collect copayments if you want to, you just don't have to, and the waiver isn't considered a kickback problem. Private insurers are all over the map. Some of them have, uh, many of them, I think, have waived the obligation to collect copayments. But if you do that, you're eating it, right? They're not going to pay you that extra money. So you have to decide if you're willing to give up that revenue or not. So this raises a question of what do you do with private insurers? Because there are all of these different rules. Um, here is my advice. I am a fan of the notify them of what you're doing. So for example, take telehealth. You don't know whether Aetna is going to allow you to bill telehealth or not. I wouldn't ask them, um, especially because it's going to be administratively very difficult for you to try to treat every private pay patient differently, right? Are you going to figure out whether I'm an Aetna or a Humana or a Cigna patient and schedule my telehealth visit accordingly? I suppose it's possible, but it's difficult. So I would just send a letter that says, hey, here's what we're doing during the pandemic, and you shoot it out and send it via certified mail, and no one's going to be able to accuse you of fraud, right, because you've told them what's going on. The worst that happens is someone writes back and says, we're not comfortable with what you're doing. The truth is I expect most of those things go into the void and you never hear another word. And if someone gets mad at you uh, two years from now, you say, hey, look, we told you what you were doing and you didn't object and you're in pretty good shape. So that's the strategy um, I would use. Now, quick note on pricing. Buried within the CARES Act was a requirement that healthcare organizations list their COVID-19 cash price on their website. And so just make sure you're doing that. Um, then an insurer either has to pay uh, that list price. If they don't have a contract with you that specifies the rate, they have to pay that whatever contracted rate, or I'm sorry, whatever rate you put on your website. Um, and I just want to mention if you're in a hospital, I hope you're paying attention to the transparency rule, which takes effect on January 1st. So we got asked a really interesting question by a hospital, which is, can we use our provider relief funds to build a new clinic? And the answer is far from clear. The language for the provider relief funds is really broad. It says you can do anything that either prevents, prepares for, or responds to coronavirus. And their argument was, hey, in this new clinic, we'll, we'll have better infection control. You know, we'll be able to separate people better and stuff like that. Arguments, it's okay. Um, also pushing it a little bit. I would say that while I am generally a fan of 
of making your own conclusion about whether something is legal and not asking for permission. In this case, I actually would ask for permission. I would, I think if you're doing something that's kind of, that you could see being on the front page of the paper as controversial as this is, I would ask. A lot of people have asked, can we make someone wear a mask? Um, and I would say, by and large, the answer is yes, with one asterisk. EMTALA requires you to treat people with an emergency condition. And so if you are a hospital and someone shows up in your emergency room and will not wear a mask, I don't think you can send that person away because I think you could run afoul of EMTALA. In, I believe, every other circumstance, I think you can make someone wear a mask um, as long as you have an exception for anything that would be discriminatory or a protected class. And I don't think that there is a, I, I don't see how anyone could make a cogent, credible argument that a mask hurts them based on a protected class. Um, I just, I don't see how that's going to fly. So I think you can make people wear masks. I think you're, you're, um, you have that ability. So in my last question before, I've got a couple of questions I see people have sent in is, can we force employees to vaccinate? Um, and more guidance may come on this. So my colleagues in the health law, or in the health law group, in the employment group at Fredrickson have done a, uh, a question of the day on a bunch of topics. And they've got a really good answer on this one. Uh, and you can click on the link here. But the answer is basically, as long as there is an exception for um, religious and medical exceptions, you know, obviously if someone's got an allergy to, um, to something, to one of the ingredients, you can't make them do it, um, and a, a bona fide religious exception, then you can probably make people get vaccinated. Um, so um, probably more to come on that. So before I answer the couple of questions that I've seen come in, I will just say that when I am working from the office, this is the view that I have. Um, and a, I miss it, and B, that rainbow reminds me eventually this is going to end and things are going to get better. And boy, I look forward to that day because I want my uh, airplane pretzels. So the first question I see is the hospital I worked at recently cut my salary, even though I am on contract. Are they entitled to do this? And if I probably have to be a bit careful answering this because it's possible I represent the hospital um, uh, or something like that. Um, and so, and also, frankly, I can't answer it very well because it depends entirely on what the terms of that contract are. Um, and so that this is a hard question to answer in the abstract. This is purely a, well, what's the contract say and what kind of guarantees does it include? You know, for example, if they can, if they could terminate you, um, then they certainly could lower your pay, but if they can't terminate you, know, so it, it, that's a complicated one and I'm going to punt. Um, as a physician, how do I respond to a colleague who fails to report an exposure to COVID-19? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, so first thing to keep in mind is that uh, there are often multiple angles of attack. And whenever a physician is acting improperly, one thing to put in the back of your mind is, do you have a duty to report them to the medical board? And I'm, this is a little off topic, but I'm going to spend a second on Something that I think healthcare organizations need to think about when they are trying to be nice to people. And I am generally a giant fan of being nice to people. But let's look at a situation. You've got an employee and you are prepared to fire them for conduct you think is inappropriate. Um, and um, you don't want to ruin their life. So you choose not to report them to the medical board and you think you are doing them a favor and, and you are. Fast forward six months and the employee. Um, uh, files suit against you and says that they don't, that, you know, there wasn't a legitimate basis for firing them. Um, uh, and you say, you know, you're, you're going back and forth on this. And then they ask, well, did you report me to the medical board? And you say, no. And they would say, well, if you thought the behavior was really bad, how come you didn't report it to the board? And your good deed is now used against you. And that I realize is not the question. Um, uh, that was being asked here exactly, but I just mentioned it to say, whatever else you do, just have in the back of your mind, do you have a duty to report them to the board? Um, and, and you might. Um, and then um, uh, I think, you know, ultimately here, you've got sort of this patient safety question. And I guess I, I'm, I'm interpreting that question as someone who has possibly been exposed and is now continuing to treat patients. 
Um, and I think then the other question is what degree of, are we talking about for exposure? Because I'm going to, I remember early on in this, I remember the clin I had a clinic where um, a doctor had flown back from Florida and staff were like, we shouldn't let that doctor treat patients because they were on a plane. Um, and my advice at the time was, yes, they were on a plane, but is, I don't know that being on a plane is materially different than having shopped at Target, right? And we're not preventing every doctor who has gone to the movies, and this was early, this was kind of right at the beginning of the, of, of the, of the lockdown. You know, I, I don't know that planes are different from, from grocery stores. Um, and so whatever rules we're setting up need to be consistent. And so I'm assuming here that you've got like a, a physician who is exposed to a patient who's tested positive and it's their spouse or their child or something like that. Um, and there, I think you report, I think you need to deal with it um, uh, internal. Uh, you, you probably need to talk with your HR folks and report it. Uh, the last question is unfortunately above my pay grade, but I'll tell you how I would answer it. So is there a clear process for submitting PPP loan forgiveness? Um, there, Clear no, there is a process. This is uh, a colleague in my office, Margie Amen, works on that. And so, um, uh, uh, if, you, if, if you send me an email on this, um, I will get you information. In fact, speaking of sending me an email, our firm does free monthly webinars, much like this one. And if you are not on our list for that, and you would like to be, you can shoot me an email and I will get you added to uh, the list for those, and they are they are totally totally free. Um, and I thought that the last slide I had was my email, but it is not. <laughs> so it's on the first slide, uh, and so you can email me that way, uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, so Anna, I, I that's all I got. We're right at the end of the hour here. Uh, I will turn it back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. That was a great presentation. And everyone, as David did mention, Fredrickson and Byron does do similar webinars to the one that you did tune into today. And we do have many of their presentations up on our website. And now on the screen, you should be seeing my email. If you have any questions about the presentation, I would be happy to forward those over to David. I will be sending out the slides and a recording of this presentation within the next 24 hours so you can rewatch and follow along. Up on the slide should also be the SHRM and HRCI code. Please go ahead and take the time to copy those down. And if you have any questions about those, you can go ahead and email me at address on the screen. And on that note, thank you so much, David, and everyone have a great rest of your day.